am Randy Saad. For those of you who don't know me, really excited to be here with my colleague, Bill. Um, <clears throat> we've tried to design the session in a really participatory way. So I, I appreciate some of you might, might have already been in several of our sessions or other sessions today and maybe feeling a little tired. We're going to try and make this a little more interactive and engaging so that the workshop is offering you some learning by actually, you know, engaging with information about both real and um, hypothetical organizations um, as part of experiencing and really developing an internalized understanding of what the heck this method of context-based sustainability is, how it works, and the ways that it makes a difference. So on that note, we can dive in. Um, a couple of quick objectives that I'll just read through to give you a sense as to what you might expect today. So, you know, we want to help you understand what the heck context-based sustainability, or CBS, as we'll refer to it in short form, is. Um, we're going to try and help you discern or, or understand how to distinguish ideas or approaches that are incremental in nature versus those that enable the pursuit of authentic sustainability. We're going to cover some case study examples of context-based sustainability and implementation at the city of Nanaimo, where I've had the opportunity to apply it over the last couple of years. Um, we're going to help you understand how context-based sustainability con connects with systems dynamics and talk a little bit about some of the historical foundations as well as the future tra trajectories that are of relevance for context-based sustainability in the world. Um, in terms of an agenda, we'll start with a, a brief overview of CBS. We'll talk about scope and materiality. We'll go through some detail on indicators and metrics. We'll look at history and progress and then finish with a, a call to action for you all, as well as a little conclusion. Um, yes, so in terms of systems theory and systemic design, there's a, I guess there's a, a bit of a, a setup um, in terms of how context-based sustainability makes sense from our perspective. Um, you know, I think, as a foundation, when we talk, if you were part of the previous session where we talked about systemic management innovations and the transition towards systemic management, our general view is that if we take a systemic approach to the world, we're likely to produce better outcomes. We generally relate to conventional management as a gross oversimplification of the complexity of reality. And, you know, it's been relatively good enough for the past, whatever, 50 to 75 years that it's reigned supreme. But that was also in a period of time where the world was relatively static. Um, we're now 50 years post um, first overshooting our planetary boundaries. And I think it's quite evident that the unintended consequences of that overshoot are starting to show up in ways that they haven't previously. There was obviously a delay. And now that we're experiencing the consequences of functioning unsustainably, <laughs> unsustainably and based on our ways of making sense of the world, which are reflected very much in our oversimplified version of organizational management, we're now in a, a very challenging situation. And so for us, systems theory, including the application or alignment with the natural and social sciences, is integral to our ability to navigate optimally. Regardless of whether or not your your interest is profit first, or you know you're a real humanitarian, understanding the complexity that exists in our reality is fundamentally critical to our ability to navigate it effectively. Period. End of story. I hope you buy you can buy into that as a, a sort of general pretense. Now, some of the challenges though, when it comes to the application of systems theory in terms of solving our world problems, whether that's specifically in the corporate sustainability space or from a management perspective, we see a couple of issues. So I think it's fair to say that systems theory has become more popular among leaders, you know, whether it's through training, courses, just the general awareness of systems theory, et cetera. Um, the issue that we see is that there are generally one or two limiting factors. So one way systems theory typically shows up is from a problem solving perspective. So we see people applying um, techniques that involve systems mapping, understanding relationships, dynamics, governance structures, and going about solving complex systemic issues with a multitude of different actors in a collective manner. And that's fantastic, it's wonderful. And what often happens is the people who are involved in those collective conversations go back with the solutions that have been developed collectively to their own organizations, and they run into the inertia of how plans are developed, how budgets are distributed, how decisions are made, 
which are not really compliant or congruent with the systemic approach that was used to solve the problem. And so the benefits of a systemically solved problem or solution, designed, a systemically designed solution, are often lost because the organization isn't capable of delivering on them in the ways that are necessary. The other way we see systems thinking or theory show up in the world is at a macro scale. So you see on this slide the SDGs and the donut economics model. I'm, I imagine you're probably familiar with at least one of them. Essentially, they point to the idea that we need to navigate towards science and ethics-based thresholds as part of ensuring the sustainability of the planet. Now, they're wonderful frameworks and they're super useful, but they're designed at a macro scale. So if you go to an organizational leader and say, make sense of these inside of your organization and come to really pragmatic and optimal decisions about the things that you need to balance or compromise, there isn't really the means or guidance to enable that to happen in a reliable or consistent manner. So the macro level solutions, while useful in terms of building perspective and support principally, don't actually enable the kind of change that needs to happen in a practical, pragmatic way within an organizational setting. And so we need something more. And on that note, I'll pass on to Bill to talk about context-based sustainability. Cheers. So speaking of uh, practical and pragmatic, um, we wanted to hand it over to you all to uh, do a little exercise, a hands-on exercise here, just to, to introduce these concepts, not in theory or conceptually to begin with, but, but rather with an exercise. So our question here is, which company is more sustainable, uh, company A or company B? Uh, so uh, just if, if somebody would like to go off mute and um, share your thoughts and also folks can just, um, you know, throw into the sidebar an A or a B, um, which, which company is, is more sustainable? Any ideas? Go ahead, folks. I would say I don't know because it's just one indicator and I don't know the rest. <laughs> I would build on that. I'm completely missing context. What what are these companies doing? What context are they operating in? I, I think you all are, are figuring out that this is a, a little bit of a of a trick question, but I, I like the, the, the person who um there's 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 somebody who sort of fell for the trick in the sense that what we're trying to show here is that company B reduced its water usage. And so one would think that uh, uh, company B is more sustainable. And in fact, that's what one would think from the, the, the broad um, communications about quote unquote sustainability is that reducing your impact is synonymous with sustainability. But as, as somebody voiced here, um, you know, it's missing the key context. So that is the trick in our question. And Randy, if you go to the next slide, you'll see. So it all depends on the threshold of renewable water availability on a watershed basis. So if company A is increasing its water use, but it's still underneath the threshold of available water, it is operating sustainably. Whereas if we look on the right and company B, which one would think is more sustainable, it's actually its threshold uh, in the watershed that it operates in, and, and importantly, its fair share of the renewable water availability or its allocation, which we'll share a little bit more about in a moment, um, is a much lower threshold. And therefore, all of its operations have been unsustainable, even though they are uh, 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 reducing. So um, thanks, thanks, Lynn, for noting that this was a, a nifty trick. Um, but we did this in order to demonstrate, just as, as one of you mentioned, that you can't discern sustainability without the context of the operating environment, both the threshold uh, uh, of the, the systemic level threshold and the allocation of that threshold to a company level. So Randy, uh, next, next slide, um, over to you for just a couple of slides on sort of broad context, and then I'll take it back up with, with uh, some more specific context. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Bill. And perhaps if uh, the uh, the co co originator of context based sustainability was with us, we might end up with a, a little bit of a longer definition of context based sustainability. But in the interest of time, uh, we'll we'll trim it down from what Mark McElroy would would probably have us convey because there is a lot to understanding all the the different aspects of context based sustainability. We refer to it as an integrated, equity informed management accounting method that helps us to authentically measure an entity's performance against science and ethics based sustainability thresholds. Um, CBS as a method is the world's, world's first integrated multi capital and context based measurement and reporting method. And it was really designed to transform how we measure and manage triple bottom line performance and ultimately to help us accelerate our progress towards a sustainable future. Um, back to you, Bill, or is this for me? Yeah. Uh, you, you can go ahead and take that one, Randy, since you've done this particular exercise before. Fantastic. So same same sort of approach. We're going to ask you to, to answer to some of these questions. And I, I liked Morgan's suggestion of um, using the thumbs up or the heart and uh, as a way of, you know, offering your, your vote. But um, we're going to look at a few examples here. So, you know, as, as Bill was saying, sustainability performance can really only be authentically measured with reference to a threshold. And that threshold can't be arbitrary either. It needs to be aligned with some sort of credible, unbiased science or ethics-based threshold uh, or, or um, notion of a threshold. Um, and ultimately, if we choose to rely on incremental indicators, they, they really only tell us if we're doing less harm or some more good. They don't really comment on sustainability itself. So um, we're going to go through these four different scenarios and the question is is it um does this tell us how sustainable an organization is performing according to a threshold a science or ethics based threshold yes or no so yes will be let's say a thumbs down is that readily accessible and yes would so no is a thumbs down yes is a thumbs up or are the thumbs down not easily accessible in the list of no. Maybe just a Y and an N in the sidebar. Perfect. Y or N. Excellent. So City, City A reduced its emissions by 30% in 2024. This one should be relatively easy. I'll give you 10 seconds to reply. Does it tell us anything about sustainability performance? Accordance with thresholds. Very good. The answer is it does not. It tells us we reduced emissions. We don't know what a fair, just, or equitable allocation of emissions would be for the city in the question here, um, and we don't know where they started, et cetera. So there's really not enough context for us to discern anything meaningful. The next one, City B consumes less water per capita than any city in the world. Does that tell us anything authentic about their sustainability performance in terms of water consumption? Getting lots of ends here. Glad to hear. Glad to hear. Because the answer is indeed no. It tells us you're doing better than all the cities in the world, but it could very well be that every single city in the world is highly unsustainable, which in most cases would be true. Maybe not so much with water, but in general, yes. Um, so yeah, it does not. How about City C? They meet the minimum wage requirements for 100% of their employees. Does that tell us about sustainability performance? We've got three yeses uh, and a sustainability of what question mark? Hmm. I love the sustainability of what question. Does somebody who answered yes want to share why they think that this would be an authentic measure of sustainability performance? Would anybody be willing to jump in and share? Anthony, Sean, and Anna. Oh, here we go. Uh, Anthony said, because the threshold is in there, fair wages. Great point, Anthony. And I guess that maybe leads me to my question um, around what is the threshold when it comes to sustainable levels of pay? What is the design of minimum wage? And might I ask, is there a difference between what we see as a typical minimum wage versus a living wage, for example, which is de designed based on what we understand is kind of necessary at a minimum in order to 
you know, cover the costs or expenses of life. Yeah. Yeah. Victor noted that minimum wages often are not fair. Uh, minimum Morgan added minimum uh, does not equal a living wage. Uh, uh, so, and Anthony noted, good point. Fair is not the same as, as minimum. So we've got, I think we've, I think we've gotten understanding on on the, the the trick element of this question. Very good. Yeah. At the end of the day, um, threshold is only authentic if it's aligned with some sort of unbiased form of generally accepted science or or an ethical framework that would be considered reliable. So in this case, that is not what a minimum wage is, though. Uh, yeah. A living wage could be that, depending on how it's formulated. That's right. And the, depending on how it's formulated, uh, Jenna just said, and who decides uh, fair, which is a, a key question in context-based sustainability, is that you have to set a, a, a threshold and an allocation, but that can differ depending on who feels like they are authorized to do so. So key question, Jenna. Back to you, Randy. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, the CityD example is pretty easy, and this is uh, this audience is maybe a, a little too sophisticated for, for some of this stuff. So I think the three examples are probably a good start for us. Cool. Everyone's got the thinking going. I'll pass back to you, Bill. Great. Thanks, Randy. And uh, the next slide just uh, uh, gives a, a, a kind of a, a whimsical uh, sense of uh, thresholds and allocations. If you can toggle over to that next slide, Randy. Of course. Great. So, so as you already seen, most of you are familiar with the donut, which is a sense of a of a threshold. Um, and the other uh, image is allocation or a fair slice of the pie. And we're just going to give some quick background on on these uh, concepts, uh, just to give our grounding before we go into some specific examples. So, next slide, please, Randy. So thresholds are, uh, you know, drawing on a, a version of the donut model on the left here. This is this is pulling from graphics from the impact management platform uh, that we at R three uh, helped for them to to create. It's a it's a pretty good page on thresholds and allocations, and so. Their thresholds note that the um, the inner ring of the donut is the social foundation. And in order to be sustainable, you need to not shortfall or undershoot that social foundation. Uh, the outer ring is the ecological ceiling. And apologies, it looks like they have a, um, a typo in there. It's not the social ceiling, it's the ecological ceiling. And if you exceed the ecological ceiling, that leads to overshoot of the carrying capacity of that system. And so what we like about this page is that it gives a general definition of thresholds, in particular that society or ecological thresholds identified by science help establish the foundations and ceilings that earth and societies should seek to operate within to prevent harm to people and the natural environment. So thresholds are critical contextual reference points for organizations assessing whether an outcome is sustainable on the one hand or uh, unsustainable. And Morgan, thanks so much for, for adding the link there. If folks want to check out that um, website. Uh, and Jenna, sorry for, for, <laughs> for triggering your, uh, your, uh, your hunger here. Uh, Randy, next slide, we'll, we'll go to the allocation side. So allocations are, so, so we have this threshold, at, say, at a systems level, but the question is, you know, if you've got multiple actors uh, in, in, in who are all using a, a resource from the commons, how do you slice that in a fair way? So here's an example of water, you know, a, as a drop of water and the various different allocations. Um, what this points out is that before you allocate anything to human use, you've got at the top terrestrial ecosystems. So evapotranspiration, evaporation and transpiration are two sort of wonky terms for, you know, what happens to water uh, um, even before it's available for, for use. So you have to allocate that. You also have to allocate for freshwater ecosystems. So the actual uses by plants and animals 
um, uh, in their ecosystems. And, and then finally, in the middle, you get to a, a human right to consumption. Um, it's only when you get to the bottom that you have the, the economic and social water allocation. So, um, you know, commercial use of that water is, is, is only after water has been allocated um, uh, to other uses already. And then even within all of the economic actors in a watershed, a specific facility only gets its fair share of that. Um, so that's a general sense of how allocation works. Um, on the next slide is an example of how these allocations are done. Um, this is from a, a, a paper that I wrote for the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development compared to what in 2019. And at that point, uh, physical per capita and economic allocation were the the general approaches that had been adopted um, to date. Uh, per capita was actually the first where you compare an organizational population to that of the reference community. So, you know, a, a company compared to uh, a, a company's, um, uh, excuse me, employee base compared to the, the lar larger population. Uh, that could be on a watershed basis, a bioregional basis, a state, a nation, or the entire world if you're doing greenhouse gas emissions, for example. Uh, or it could be a physical allocation. So uh, an organization, let's say a cement maker, um, you know, has uh, X market share, if you will. Uh, so that's how you would divvy it up their responsibility for respecting this threshold based on their size of the market or their share of the market. And then finally, economic allocation would be, well, if we're wanting to slice a pie, we could consider the entire pie to be GDP or gross domestic product. And a company's um, uh, value add would be its share of the economic allocation. Each of these approaches has their sh uh, strengths and, and weaknesses. So economic allocation is particularly strong because there is a lot of data available on that. Um, whereas many people view that as, you know, just perpetuating the problem of uh, the capitalist system. Those are, so those are some of the allocation approaches. Just one thing quickly I'll say is that there are some, uh, some impacts that aren't a, a shared impact. You don't have to allocate. So, for example, respecting human rights, there's no allocation of that. A company is 100% uh, responsible for respecting human rights. Same thing with fair pay, for example. So just one, that's a confusion that often arises on this front. Uh, next slide then, Randy, and over to you, I think. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Um, so I'm excited to, to bring you all into uh, my world of working with the city of Nanaimo on their 2022 city plan. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer. It's really a community-focused plan that they call the city plan. And the idea behind this was um, as, a, as a novel approach versus creating just an independent community plan, 20-year community plan, as, a, as municipalities often do, they decided to try and integrate six different plans into one, including their official community plan, the Parks, Recreation, Cultural Wellness Plan, Transportation Plan, et cetera. Um, and so as part of their, their city planning approach, a couple of city councilors bumped into the donut economics model. If you're unfamiliar, I'm not going to take the time now to explain it, but it's very easily searchable. It's quite prominent in the kind of systems and systemic design space. Um, it's really a, a framework designed to support um, making it easier to understand and concretely make sense of what a threshold is. So they talk about planetary boundaries and social foundations. And Nanaimo decided, well, there isn't a Canadian city yet that has adopted the donut economics model, although there are many leading cities across the world that have, and they wanted to be the first. And so they said, why don't we use the donuts the context or a framework um, to support the development of our 20 year community plan. And so they started down this path and they, uh, they happened to pick up the, the donut economics model and the guidance that they provide to both cities and, and organizations of different kinds to make sense of the donut and organizational scale. Um, 
though they, they, they ran into some challenges, uh, which we'll talk about in more detail later on. But essentially, they, they came up with their own version of the donut based on their own unique context. Uh, and that you see represented here in this visual where they came up with five high-level city goals. And what you'll eventually see is 35 topic areas, which are you know key or important matters that relate to each of these major five city goals. And they use this as the frame or the basis for developing their community plan, including engagement with the public and other stakeholders across the organization. Um, I want to, and I apologize, I apologize for the, the lack of re resolution here. Um, I want to talk about um, the, the gap between commitment and practice. So um, the one example I'm going to speak to throughout the presentation as we come back to the Nanaimo example several times is around water. So water availability shows up in the donut and it's something that they want to address. And based on the limited guidance uh, the donut method uh, provides, they decided to include water resources in their community plan. And specifically they define that as everybody having access to clean drinking water. And essentially that, the, that it's not at the expense of future generations ability to have access to clean drinking water. So uh, as a starting point around water resources, they drafted an indicator, which was water consumption by residents. And while there's no target that's published here in this piece that I pulled out of their integrated plan, um, what they did come up with was something like a 30% reduction in their water consumption year over year. Um, given the conversation we already had, I'm sure you can start to make sense of why that wasn't really consistent with the threshold and how based on the lack of guidance that they had, they immediately stepped over what defines a threshold and continue to navigate towards incremental progress. Um, but we'll delve into more deeply why that's so and how that transformed as they had the opportunity to apply context-based sustainability with us in practice. So I'll pass back over to Bill now, who will talk a little bit about scope and materiality. Great, thanks, Randy. Um, and we'll start with just a definition of scope and materiality. This is drawn from, we've mentioned the, the UNRISD work, United Nations Research Center uh, uh, um, uh, for Social Development um, uh, uh, Research Institute, excuse me. Uh, and we'll be coming back to that in a little bit more detail throughout. Um, but this is their definition, uh, is that the entity determines the scope and materiality of its triple bottom line accounting. The materiality determination process involved assessing and prioritizing impacts on the carrying capacities of resources that are vital for human well-being and planetary health. Uh, and we mentioned this before, but and we'll say a little bit more later, but carrying capacity is, in this instance, essentially synonymous with a threshold. Um, and then it also involves stakeholder engagements to incorporate the views of a broad range of stakeholders and to discharge its duties and obligations of managing its impacts affecting stakeholder well-being. So that's sort of a, a um, concise definition. Let's unpack that a little bit with a, a hands-on example. And so the example that we wanted to use was looking at municipalities at um, and just defining that at, at two levels. One level would be the municipal co corporation itself. So many municipalities are, are, are organized as a corporate entity. So this is the organization that is charged with governing that um, uh, uh, community. But you could also think of municipality as a the community itself, or, so a sort of broader, the entire geographic area under consideration. So these are two areas that are um, often um, uh, you thought of when you use the term municipality. Um, and so we wanted to ask you all, what are the key employment considerations for municipalities and leave it in your uh, hands to, to, to give a sense of, of um, sort of what scope that would apply to. So uh, folks can just, you know, 
uh, type into the sidebar or if anyone wants to go um, off mute. We've in some ways already started to talk about this with one of the earlier examples. Um, but what are, what are some of the key employment considerations for municipalities? Bill, are you asking for the municipal community, municipal corporation, or both and separately? Um, I'm kind of leaving it up to folks. I'm leaving that unclear uh, uh, on purpose to, 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 to give folks an opportunity to grapple with that, with that question. So we'll look, wait a moment to see if uh, folks want to type something in here or go off mute. So I guess given, given the relative silence, I'm gonna be a little bit more pointed. Um, so going back to our earlier uh, uh, issue, um, the question of living wage would come up. And the question is um, where does living wage get applied? And Randy, it, it, it might be helpful for you to just give some background on the, the, the implications of answering this question at these different scopes. Sure, yeah, I, I think the reason why the question Bill is asking is so critical is um, there is an exceptional degree of complexity in making sense of sustainability performance. And if we're not, if we don't have like a clear methodological approach to making sense of some of these things, they just go unseen and then we overstep complexity and come up with solutions that don't make sense. So for example, scope is a critical aspect of completing an authentic assessment of sustainability performance. And what we've seen with municipalities that try and adopt the donut like Nanaimo did is there's no step anywhere in the simple guidance they're provided that says, define the scope of the entity that you're assessing the sustainability performance of. And so we'll end up seeing them develop indicators and metrics that sometimes are focused at a community scale and other times are focused at a corporate scale. And um, for reasons that I hope are obvious, if you're trying to measure sustainability performance and you're toggling between two different entities at two different scales, whatever the output is, isn't, congruent, like you will have a whole bunch of indicators and metrics that don't actually tell you something about one entity. So it's not useful. It would be like the equivalent of taking a business unit in an organization and the entire corporation and using some metrics and financial statements from the individual business unit and others from the whole corporation. And then putting all that together and saying, here's what the performance is. It wouldn't make any sense, right? It's it just not compliant. And Randy, just to piggyback on that and to give you all a, a bit of a sense of why we were uh, doing this particular exercise is that when we look at the data that is coming back from municipalities in particular um, in, in applying the, the, the donut guidance, um, if we don't discern between whether we're talking about employment at the municipal corporation level or the municipal community level, um, there could be data that comes back that is completely, call it incommensurate. So if we have living wage at the municipal corporation that's reported, but it's not sort of indicated that that's the, the scope, compared to another city that reported municipal uh, employment uh, or living wage, for example, at the community level, we will have a mismatch in that data without even realizing that there's a mismatch in the data. Um, and really some of the, some of the uh, uh, comments that came in speak to this. So Anna said, living wage should apply to the community at large, but in reality, this is not easy because the municipality is competing with other municipalities for employment opportunities. So, um, you know, it, it, it could be that, uh, you know, municipality A, somebody uh, is paying a living wage, um, but that 
costs more, and so therefore they have to um, uh, 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 have a, a, a higher tax rate, for example. Anna didn't say that, but I'm just extrapolating out. Um, and then Victor noted, uh, do you mean considering things like cost of living, housing, food, et cetera, to see what kind of income people need and the types of jobs that support that, uh, or even in determining living wage? So these are key considerations. The, the, the primary point we're trying to make here is, is slightly nuanced in the sense that the scope that you choose says everything about the data that you come up with. And it's another type of context. And so Randy, you had some very specific examples of this from Nanaimo that I think will help illustrate what we're trying to demonstrate here. For sure. And just before I go there, I want to address Anna's final point and, mm. and zoom out just a moment because you started with the broader question about what are the key employment considerations for municipalities. And I think what, what I, you, I think to prompt some, some participation, you, you mentioned living wages as, a, as an entry point. But what I want to highlight is if we're thinking about employment at a community scale, like what's the sustainability performance of the community, then we're concerned with things like the sufficiency of the workforce. Do we have the skilled workforce that we need to fulfill on the needs of all the organizations in our community so that they can continue to function effectively? Uh, we're concerned with employment rates. Like, are there enough jobs for everyone in our community? And then there's, there's all kinds of science and study that indicates what, like, our, what, what sustainability thresholds could be. In those in those terms because they've been studied the world around and lots of conclusions have been drawn around you know employment rates shouldn't be at zero ever that's not actually a sustainable outcome but there's a whole complexity in that at, a, at an organizational scale though the city as a corporate entity is probably not responsible for there being sufficient workforce in the entire community to support right. all the businesses that are out there but what they would be concerned with is their own workforce and you know whether or not they have a living wage and whether or not the people that they're employing are underemployed or effectively employed, et cetera. So it just speaks to the fact that the entity, which is what defines the scope, will inform what gets measured or what is material, said another way. Um, so to Bill's point, just to talk a little bit about uh, materiality and the scope of assessment at NIMO, I mean, immediately as we looked at I did a first pass at the indicators that they had drafted. Um, it became immediately clear that there was this lack of definition of scope. So some of their indicators were focused on the community and some of them were focused more internally. And so that became um, something that was challenging to grapple with, but immediately an opportunity for them to improve their reporting using context-based sustainability and understanding that distinction. And I might offer, I think, much of uh, the discipline in context-based sustainability just comes from making clear distinctions of necessary terms that don't exist in most of the guidance um, that we see in frameworks like the donut or the SDGs. They're just absent of these necessary distinctions. And many of them uh, can and, and are informed based on understanding what's worked in management accounting practice for, for decades and how that's been refined as a point of reflection. And that really speaks to the history of CBS. Um, so, in particular, going back to our water example, they started by looking at consumption, and uh, that was uh, a challenge in that they, I think, quickly, pretty quickly realized that consumption wasn't so much an issue. It wasn't what they would call a material issue in their community because the watershed they're dependent on is quite rich. And they're aware, based on measures that already exist, that they weren't so concerned with the sufficiency of the water supply for Nanaimo, the place. And to be clear, given that they were developing a 20-year community plan, they defined the scope as being the community, Nanaimo, the place, not their, their corporate entity. Um, so we continued this on this path of inquiring about what um, could be material because they didn't seem to be resolved by this idea that consumption wasn't an, so much an issue for them to be concerned with. Um, and then they pointed out that they were actually concerned with the supply of water. So um, they have a water reservoir that's responsible or that um, essentially um, delivers water to the entire community. And the city is 100% responsible for that water supply. And essentially uh, it had started to get dangerously low 
at different points, especially as they have encountered increasingly long drought periods. And so they saw some necessity to develop an indicator and a threshold related to water supply, which is a very different form of resource from a, a multi-capital perspective. It's a form of social capital, and that would be uh, under the category of constructed capital specifically. And it does have a threshold, which is the upper limit or the capacity of that reservoir to fulfill on the needs of the community. So it sent us down a very different path which was an, an eye-opening experience. And if I can suggest, it was the kind of thing that happened through what were literally you know, dozens of conversations. We were negotiating and, and, and facilitating with our client who was the manager of sustainability. She was made responsible for developing indicators, metrics and targets related to the draft plan that they had established. And so we were just facilitating with her and providing her with guidance and feedback. And she was meeting with senior leadership and the engineering department, the planning department, the asset management department, et cetera, and having all of these different conversations, trying to discern what was what. And it was really interesting how things unfolded. But I'll pause there and we'll come back to the example uh, at the end of the next section. Uh, yeah, and back over to you, Bill. Oh, and actually, there's, I forgot to come back to Anna's uh, point in the chat. I, I forgot about that completely. Apologies. Um, Anna had asked the question about um, what to do when uh, public sector organizations say we start with our own internal focus and then work outward. Um, and this to me is where I think um, cross organize sort of organizational transformation more broadly is necessary. We can't change management practices, individual management practices in isolation. Um, and ultimately it touches with the concept of materiality. So from my perspective, the question I would ask, and I get this isn't a simple thing to address in the municipality is like, what is the purpose of the municipality? And I think, um, I would say most people would have a hard time finding a municipal leader in this day and age who would say it's something other than enabling the well-being of the community they serve. For sure there's a service delivery core mandate or legal mandate that underpins the organization but they know they're there for something more than just delivering the services that they're responsible for. And so if the purpose of the organization is to enable the well-being of the community they serve, well, then the question is really, given the levers that we have, whether that's direct investments, the services we deliver, our ability to facilitate and convene with multiple partners, to develop policies, et cetera, how can we enable the well-being of our community? And so it's pretty irrational to say we just focus on our own processes and then look outward. The biggest levers, the greatest opportunities to optimize for purpose, which is to enable the well-being of the community, lie in any number of different places, depending on what it is you're trying to accomplish, who the stakeholders are, and what power or levers the, the city happens to hold in that domain. So I get this as a reaction or a response, but it comes from a very compartmentalizing, narrow, fixed, and limiting view of, of management that is reductionist and not really um, designed systemically. Something we addressed in our previous session on sort of uh, organizational transformation and bringing a systems lens to everything, not just performance management, but we won't address today. But I really appreciate the comment and the opportunity to talk a little bit about how that would be addressed, I guess, in, in terms of our worldview and, and approach to engaging with leadership. Back over to you, Bill. Great, thanks, Randy. And the next thing that this leads to from um, the scope and materiality side of things, um, as we'll see on the next slides, um, is the notion of indicators and metrics. Uh, so if we've decided what the scope of materiality is, then we really need to build um, indicators uh, that we would track and the metrics that we would use to, to, to do that tracking. Um, so uh, that's, that's where we're heading next. And uh, to give you the, a little bit of background here, many people look to the, the Sustainable Development Goals as sort of the leading um, uh, global uh, indicators, if you will, of sustainability. And yet, if you look at the SDG indicators, there are 231 unique indicators. And if you look at them, there are only a handful that actually integrate thresholds into them. So we just pulled a, a, a few examples where the you know a poverty line is a, a an actual threshold, or the the proportion of available fresh water resources. 
But the point of this slide is actually the exact opposite, which is the the um, 220 some odd indicators that have nothing to do with sustainability. Um, the, the, the vast majority of these indicators that purport to be about sustainability are really uh, uh, purely incrementalist. Um, and so uh, on, on the next slide, uh, this is precisely why the United Nations Research uh, Institute for Social Development um, pursued in, in the middle of the slide, the sustainable development performance indicators. And you can see that that's from 2018 to 2022. Uh, we at R3.0, my organization, partnered with UNRIS throughout this process uh, to help um, conceptualize, uh, develop, and pilot these, uh, these indicators. Um, and at the end of that process, uh, the document on the left um, was, was published by UNRIS, and this is called uh, Authentic Sustainability Assessment. Uh, and it is a manual for um, implementing these sustainable development performance indicators. Um, one call out in the in the the, the right hand side is just a, a quote that's pulled from one of the reports in the SDPI uh, a body of of knowledge that was created. That conventional approaches tend to obfuscate important contextual condition, conditions that are needed to effectively assess progress or assess performance. Uh, more effective approaches include the use of sustainability norms or targets against which to measure progress. Without such context, it is impossible to know where, where a company is truly positioned in a sustainability pathway. So this is really kind of restating something that we've been reiterating throughout here. Um, finally, in the bottom of this, uh, is is a, a box directly from this uh, manual that points to the use of the sustainability quotient, which we'll share a little bit more about um, in a future slide. But just this is by way of saying that uh, the UNRIS embraced context-based sustainability um, and this thresholds-based approach um, at its core. Uh, so next slide, just uh, this is a, a full listing. This is actually included in a recent KPMG article that is summarizing this, but this gives an example of um, a full example of some of the conventional ESG approaches in the middle column there compared to the authentic sustainability approach. Uh, and it, we feel like it's important that UNRISD introduce this notion of authentic. Um, and so we wanted to just give you, uh, a, 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 we put this here just for your reference, we'll make these slides available, but it's really the, the next slide where we uh, go through another one of these um, comparisons. So on greenhouse gas emissions, company A reduced its carbon emissions per unit of revenue or output by 5% between 2015 and 2020. Um, uh, just uh, 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 putting it out to you all, um, uh, and I think you'll know the answer by now, is, is this a, uh, 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 an example of a authentic sustainability? Maybe just wait for, for one answer in the sidebar here. Uh, or if somebody wanted to go off mute. Just a, a yes or no of, uh, okay, thanks, Anna. That's a, that's a clear no, in, indeed. So while company A reduced its levels of emissions intensity, absolute levels of emissions increased by 5% due to 10% growth in manufacturing output and also failed to align with science-based uh, climate change mitigation targets. So this is just one example that's actually in the report um, to, to exemplify this. Next is the tax gap. So company Z paid $5 million in corporate taxation. Uh, is that sustainable uh, or not? No, thank you, Victor. Uh, so I, I think you're getting the pattern that we're going to here. So while company Z provided millions of dollars in taxes to local and federal government authorities, 
It also engaged in tax avoidance strategies involving significant profit shifting to low tax jurisdictions and had a considerable tax gap. That is, its effective tax rate or the amount of taxes it actually play, paid was substantially below the statutory tax rate or the taxes that it was supposed to pay. So both of these are actual indicators in the authentic sustainability uh, assessment manual, uh, actual uh, sustainable development performance indicators that also have metrics associated with them or methodologies for making this kind of measurement. Um, and I think that that's, those are the only two examples that we included before going to some specific examples from Nanaimo. Oh, I'm sorry. We did include one more around collective bargaining, which was that company Y covered a significant 70% uh, uh, of employees in collective bargaining agreements. Uh, and then the context based is while a significant proportion of company Y's employees were co covered, um, over five years, this declined from 85 to 70 percent. Furthermore, the data only related to full-time regular employees. During this period, the company reduced the proportion of full-time employees and relied more on subcontracted or part-time labor that was denied these core labor rights. Additionally, the company-wide figure of 70 percent masked wide variations in coverage by affiliate or region where the company operated. All of these are dimensions that are covered in the collective bargaining indicator in the sustainable development performance indicators um, body of, of, uh, uh, um, of indicators. So this just gives you an example of the, um, of the differences. Uh, and, and yeah, these were just included as examples. We've already gone through those. So Randy, over to you for the specific examples uh, from, from Nanaimo. Yeah, thanks so much, Bill. Um, hopefully this makes it a little more real uh, given that it's coming out of a, a specific example. Um, so as I mentioned, Nanaimo started with this idea, having, again, like Nanaimo started with thresholds, right? They adopted the donut and said, we're navigating towards science and ethics-based thresholds. They relied on the relatively limited um, guidance that's available. And what they came up with was water consumption and a reduction in water consumption as the, uh, as the target of something like 30%. That's where they landed left to their own devices. And based on our initial research um, on donut cities and SDG cities, Nanaimo is not an exceptional case. This is an extremely complex sort of challenge in terms of uh, methodically going through this process of making sense of thresholds. It's not easy. And our belief is that that there is a need for um, adequately sophisticated guidance to support um, the sense making that needs to happen for it to not only be generally useful and consistent as, as a form of practice, but also to be useful internally as a context specific um, interpretation of what's happening from a performance standpoint. So they went from consumption, <clears throat> as I mentioned, to looking at uh, the sufficiency of their reservoir supply. <clears throat> and I wanted to share specifically the the thresholds and metrics that came out of this. So one, maybe it's interesting to mention, as part of translation, translating the terminology internally, they came up with a different way of talking about these terms, which actually ended up being useful because it was intuitive for the stakeholders that our client was trying to engage with. So uh, instead of calling out thresholds, she described sustainability and goals, which seemed to work really well. And uh, in terms of metrics, um, they defined that as uh, unlike the equation that Bill showed on the slide from UNRISD and the SDPIs earlier, the actual measured performance divided by the sustainability end goal. So that worked for them. So in terms of the sufficiency of the reservoir supply, which I mentioned, uh, was the indicator they decided would be mo more material and useful to, to measure. They looked at the water levels at Jump Lake, which is the reservoir, being maintained at at least 30% reservoir capacity at 365 days a year. Essentially, once it goes below 30%, they have to evoke a whole bunch of, of emergency protocols because they they can't actually get to the point where there's no water in the system. So um, essentially, that has all kinds of impacts on 
businesses that rely on water, on residents, et cetera, because they're expected to change their habits in response to those emergency protocols that unfold. So the goal is that that reservoir stays above 30%, 30 365 days a year. And the way that they measured performance was to say the number of days per year that the reservoir capacity is at or above 30% divided by 365 days, which is the number of days in a year. If I could tell you how many conversations and how much iteration there was before that metric was finalized, um, we might run out of time on this session. It might sound pretty straightforward, but when you're actually in a management-oriented conversation and you're getting people across an organization to come to agreement on what way the data should be represented to inform how decisions are made and what everyone is going to react to in a consistent manner, there's actually a very different equation. And it, it, it explains exactly why a prescriptive indicator and metric isn't so useful because context is so relevant. And in this case, it's not just context from a sustainability standpoint, it's the organizational context, right? It's, it's the individuals who have to make decisions and rely on their colleagues. That context is also relevant in this, consider in this situation as they design a metric that's going to ultimately inform decisions that they're going to make internally. So even just adding in management context introduces a whole other layer of complexity. So the really in interesting thing is it went an entire layer further. I, I can't articulate off the top of my head exactly how the conversation shifted to a point where the river system came into, into focus. But essentially what happened was there was a recognition that the reservoir has historically been used for a different purpose. So as it happens, I think it's every fall, the salmon, which are an indicator species in Nanaimo, happen to run through the rivers to their spawning grounds. And it's known that if the water levels aren't sufficiently high, if there isn't a sufficiently high flow of water in the river, they can't get to their spawning grounds. And here's the amazing part, like systems sometimes laugh in your face. The salmon run at the same time that the drought season has elongated. So at the time that the water reservoir is being stretched, the salmon's need for more water in the rivers is, is actually not only there, but increasing. And so tr historically, they have actually just expelled water from the reservoir to flood the river system to allow for the salmon to move. So now you have this conundrum of supplying water sufficiently to your people and ensuring that an indicator species isn't left stranded and unable to spawn. So what the heck do you do? This is systemic complexity in real life. And the important thing about the process is that that complexity is being surfaced. It's embraced. The conversations are happening across the various departments and stakeholders who need to be part of the conversation. And the ways of resolving, or at least trying to resolve these tensions and making sense of them at a baseline, are being established as part of the process. And it's exactly this complexity that we overstep when we have overly simplified solutions that prioritize false comparability over necessary context specificity and, and really engaging the, the complexity of organizational management as part of the outcome, not just, you know, having nice sustainability indicators and metrics that we can put on the sustainability page of the organization. And this is really about optimizing the performance of the organization, not some pacification of sustainability measures or issues. Um, and so um, in terms of developing indicators and processes, I wanted to share a little bit about um, how Nanaimo took the CBS method and came up with their own mechanism or series of questions that they asked internally in order to come to conclusions on indicators and metrics. So um, they would start with an area of impact and say, is this a significant relevant issue to our community that we have the tools to deal with? So I will state, firstly, materiality is not just determined based on whether or not something's an issue. It's more about whether or not it's important for the organization. But because this was a first iteration for them, they understood that they weren't going to have the resources to develop 100 different thresholds-based indicators, which is probably what they need over time. So they decided to focus on where there was the greatest need to make progress, where they could take their limited resources and build as many really useful indicators and metrics as they could. So they started with number one. Number two was, is there a science or ethics-based sustainability end goal in this area of impact? 
relating to the core values of the framework. So amazingly, um, I, I'm sure it's hard to, to project, but often they had an area of impact that they had come up with and they would look high and low, far and wide, engage experts outside of the organization and just come to the conclusion that there just isn't a science or ethics based sustainability end goal. So it really just didn't fit into this frame. They needed to find something else that would offer a meaningful measure. Sometimes that was a good thing and sometimes that wasn't a great thing. Um, but again, necessary to make that distinction. The next question they'd ask is, is the indicator a sustainability measure of performance, not just an incremental one? And often what, what we saw as we looked at their drafts was, you know, if it did make it through number one and two, it rarely passed through number three and before we had to go back to the drawing board. And then finally, what is the threshold of the quantity of the resource or capitals involved that must be maintained in order to ensure the well-being of the community? So, um, yeah, this brings it down to the actual specifics. Not only is there a threshold, but what is it in our context specifically? And in some cases, what would the allocation be for Nanaimo if it wasn't for the entire threshold? If the entire threshold couldn't be allocated to Nanaimo itself. So just to give you another example away from water, originally in the plan, they had these four indicators that all had a close relationship to one another, transportation mode, distance driven, growth in town centers and corridors, access to daily needs. And what they determined was the first three did not have a, sustain, a science or ethics based sustainability threshold that could be associated with them. So they essentially threw them all out. And they took the fourth one, which needed some work and came up with access to daily, basic daily needs via active transportation. So what, what I really want to highlight in the process here was question um, number two, which is whether or not there's a science or ethics based sustainability end goal in this area. And it forced them to ask the question, well, what is the end goal we're trying to produce here? Like, yes, we want people to use better forms of transportation. Yes, we want them to drive less. Yes, we want to see densification in urban centers. Those are all relevant things from a planning perspective. But what is the end goal? What is like the, the highest level goal we could achieve for our community? And what they came up with was this idea that, you know, if we're, if we're succeeding, then people in our community don't need a car to survive. They can do all the things they need to do in their life without reliance on a vehicle. And ultimately, our goal is that everybody should have that liberty. They shouldn't have to own a car to survive. And if we're planning well, 100% of people should be in that boat. Is that realistic today or five years or 10 years from now? Who knows? Maybe not. But we're not trying to define how they should perform. We're trying to define what the end goal is. So they came up with that. And it seemed to, in itself, cross out all of these other potential indicators. Because if this was achieved, you probably would have a good transportation by mode value or better one. You would see lesser distances driven. You would see more growth in town centers and corridors, et cetera. But that said, they also recognized that these other indicators were useful. And we'll talk touch on that at the very end um, in that while thresholds-based indicators should be distinguished and an assessment of performance that are that is thresholds-based should stand alone as one cohesive, complete assessment, that's not to say that it's everything and that other indicators and other kinds of measures aren't also important for different reasons. And so to, to summarize a little bit, I just wanted to offer, you know, some of the things that really make context-based sustainability as a method uniquely valuable is that one, it's context specific and, and it offers the opportunity for localizing um, how we make sense of sustainability performance. Um, it's stakeholder centric and equity informed. We didn't go much into it, but essentially, developing thresholds and allocation specifically based on the method can only happen credibly and authentically if it's done with the stakeholders who are impacted. So it requires that they're part of the conversation and in agreement in order for the allocation to be considered authentic and credible. Of course, the thresholds based, uh, they're holistic and integrated. They're aligned with management accounting best practice. So one of the things that we continue to hear is that people are excited about context-based sustainability because we can have a conversation with a CFO or a director of finance and the design of the method and the terminology used and how it lay, it's laid out comes from a foundation of management accounting best practice. So it's consistent. It's, it's just a natural extension and it makes sense. It's not something new and completely different uh, out of left field. 
Um, it's also applicable at entities at any scale, whether we're looking at a, a country, a community, municipality, a business, a group. And so because it can be applied at multiple scales in a consistent manner, it has that opportunity or the potential to be scale linked. So we could see an allocation at a national scale and how that could be divided across provinces or states and how that could then be subdivided across municipalities based on a cohesive and um, universally adopted uh, view of how allocations happen. So that idea of scale linking is absolutely possible inside of context-based sustainability. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, it does have its limitations though. Um, one of the, the, the realizations that we came to is just the, the necessity, like if you really want a comprehensive view of everything that's relevant from a decision-making perspective, from a management perspective, we need to combine thresholds-based indicators and metrics with non-thresholds-based indicators and metrics that are also useful and necessary as part of providing a holistic perspective. And then sometimes as well, because we may not have the financial resources or the capacity to pursue thresholds-based indicators and metrics because the data doesn't already exist and would be very costly to acquire. We do have to get creative. And ultimately it's about being practical, right? So if we're trying to optimize, that means we need to balance our pursuits and what we try and uh, accomplish inside of the constraints of the organization in a way that's most enabling. And so there is definitely a reality quotient and a way of orienting oneself in applying something as complex and sophisticated as this that isn't about following the method in a very kind of disciplined way. It's about really understanding, making sense of it within an organizational context in a, in a flexible manner. Um, so I'll pause there. I actually just thought, given that we haven't taken a moment to give anyone the opportunity to chime in on Nanaimo specifically, mm -hmm. if the group had any questions or comments related to the Nanaimo case study. Um, anything top of mind? Anything not make sense or uh, beg explaining further? Okay, then in that case, you know, feel free to formulate your questions. If you maybe have some in the background, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll let Bill finish off our session and we can move to questions. I think we're officially done at um, 10 to, but we can absolutely bleed it, bleed on till, uh, till 3 p.m. in case uh, anyone wants to stay on and, and stay with us to, to discuss. Thank you. Over to you, Bill. Great, thanks. And, and maybe I'll just pause and, and answer uh, Anna's. Anna had three questions and, and I think that that might be just as useful as, uh, as going through these. So she's asked one, what are examples of large uh, global corporations who have attempted CBS uh, and related to what will the integrated reporting look like if the thresholds differ across communities? And three, what are the management slash organizational implications? Do they need different organizational setup and skills to adjust? How do you foster these? So the answer to the first question is, is yes. Um, you know, one example that we point to often would be um, Lockheed Martin, which has been using the uh, uh, applying a thresholds based approach to its uh, greenhouse gas emissions since before the science based targets initiative was even created. So they started in 2013. Um, ben and Jerry's actually was the first uh, company uh, as a subsidiary of Unilever back then uh, to apply the uh, thresholds based approach to its greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Biogen is another example of a large uh, global corporation that has used it for water. Um, companies that have used it across the board are, are, are fewer and further between. So it's so far that the uptake of CBS has been on an indicator by indicator or impact by impact basis. So um, we're not aware of companies that have done it um, in, a, in such a broad way uh, across the board. Um, the integrated reporting, uh, so I'll just point you to the notion of the, the, the multi-capital scorecard. That's something that we mentioned in the slides, if, if we can get to those, um, that, that uh, 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 essentially it integrates financial reporting with non-financial reporting. And instead of treating them as two separate things, it applies thresholds to both of those areas. Arguably thresholds are already applied to financial reporting. So it's sustainability reporting that has to catch up. Uh, and then finally, the or management and organizational implications. I think this is actually 
where um, Randy's work, at, and I participate with him on this, but Randy has really done the, the, the heavy lifting on it around um, enterprise evolution comes into play uh, around taking a sort of transforming from a linear um, mechanistic approach to management uh, to a, a systems-based approach. So before we move into the slides, Randy, do you want to just say a few words about enterprise evolution since it answers this third question in a sense? Sure. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it comes down to one starting with shifting the mindsets of leaders so that they begin to appreciate the necessity to transform and why conventional practices are no longer fit for purpose, which I think they're experiencing and perhaps their hammer hasn't quite dropped yet. Um, and then from there, it's having a multitude of, of different innovations that we can use in a practical way and in a facilitative manner to build new capabilities and redesign the practices of the organization over time in an iterative manner. That's the design of the, the program. It's, it's intended to help organizations build capability uh, through you know, a, a safe approach to experimentation and redesigning practices, but I'll, I'll pause there. I did want to mention one thing about the integrated reporting piece, especially sure. the mention of the different uh, thresholds across different communities. And I point back to best practice in management accounting in that, you know, if we think about financial statements as an example, nobody's ever really, be, nobody's truly concerned, or at least we've realized we can't be concerned with having two different organizations present financial reports that are immediately comparable. You know, the, I think the understanding that was developed over decades in, in the field of management accounting as a non-expert, this is me parroting, is that ultimately, um, if we give up on the intention to create false comparability, it allows us to focus on what's actually possible. And I think what's been determined is that we need to show our assumptions and enough detail that someone with due expertise can interpret the results. The average person is not going to be able to interpret the results, but the idea is that what is on paper is discernible for an expert externally and for somebody internally to make sense of. And so it, it's exactly the reason why the same company can have financial statements that show itself in the black or in the red without anything changing. That's possible and that's legal because there is a methodological approach to explaining how you're capturing information and the context within which that's happening. So I think um, it calls for a different relationship to measurement and reporting. And something that our colleague Mark McElroy has said in, in recent, recent months and, and years is this idea that in, in the sustainability field, we focused on the reporting imperative without understanding what our measurement imperative was. In management accounting, it came from a measurement practice. So we were concerned with making sense of information first and then figuring out how to represent it well. The opposite has happened in the sustainability space. And so the tail is wagging the dog and what we have is inauthentic information that doesn't really tell us internally what to do or externally how to perceive things. Yeah, and piggybacking on that, Randy, um, you know, as we speak, the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development is spearheading uh, activism across the United Nations uh, agencies to um, uh, host a conference in the coming year uh, on uh, authentic sustainability um, measurement. So shifting the focus from reporting that you know, ends up resulting in a lot of uh, defensive stances from the standard setters right now for not integrating threshold, shifting the focus to the measurement side of things precisely to kind of bypass that defensiveness while still you know, uh, uh, advocating for a thresholds-based approach to um, the assessment side of things. So, so just so that you know, there is background um, uh, advocacy and, and, and action uh, moving towards that shift towards uh, 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 measurement that integrates thresholds. Bill, um, I, well, first of all, I want to thank Anna for the wonderful questions. Um, can yeah. I suggest, just in the interest of time, yeah, and given that we talked to Unrisd already, that we jump to the call to action and conclusion and then see if there's any questions? That, that, that sounds like a great plan of action, Randy. So just two, two quick calls to action um, to end this. One is a training program, and I'm just throwing the, the um, link into the sidebar. So uh, uh, R3.0 helped to design the, the sustainable development performance indicators. And so in 2022, uh, after they were released, 
we worked with the Center for Sustainable Organizations, Mark McElroy, who you've heard from, uh, heard about um, repeatedly, uh, to design a, a, a training program. It's a two half day uh, training program with four modules that essentially introduce uh, both the, the, the conceptual foundations for the sustainable development performance indicators uh, and that conceptual foundation in context-based sustainability. And then the indicators themselves, um, looking at them in some degree of de depth, uh, also covering the background on uh, context-based materiality. Uh, and then finally, um, looking at how this is being implemented in the real world, both through some hands-on examples and looking at the changing landscape in the standard setting field to open itself up. And, and literally in this month, we have seen um, reports from the OECD um, and KPMG uh, and uh, FRAG, the, the, the European standard setter, that have been embracing the sustainable development performance indicators. So that's, uh, uh, you can sign up for that. We've got those happening on a monthly basis, uh, generally end of the month coming up. Uh, and we've got instances set through uh, March. Um, so that's one example of, of a way that you can engage in this. And, and Randy, over to you for the, the last uh, call to action here. Yeah, so this is a, a more recent development. Last six months or so, uh, we, Bill and myself, with our colleagues at uh, the University of Guelph, created a context-based sustainability community of inquiry and practice. Um, so the idea is that it's a professional network made up of those interested in learning about studying and applying context-based sustainability in practice. So we've got some people who are more on the innovation side, others who are practitioners within organizations, some consultants, representatives of NGOs and academics. And essentially we convene quarterly to discuss, share updates, talk about possible projects for collaboration, some of the things that we're up to, people bring other opportunities to the table, et cetera. Um, and uh, most recently we um, secured some social sciences and humanities research council of Canada funding to support us conducting research on our experiences at the city of Nanaimo applying context-based sustainability, as well as that of uh, donut economics and SDG cities who have been trying to pursue thresholds in the absence of an enterprise level innovation. Uh, and we're hopeful that that research really brings to light just how night and day the difference is adopting thresholds in principle and not having the management level of guidance to support applying them effectively versus actually having that in the form of context-based sustainability is one example of an innovation designed to do that. So if you are interested in, in being included on the emails about this community of inquiry and practice, it's low stakes, low commitment. You can show up to our meetings quarterly. You can engage fully. You can connect with us. I'm going to put my email address in the chat. Feel free to reach out and we'll, uh, we'll add you into our network if uh, that's of interest. And uh, I guess on that note, I'll just say a big thank you um, to Morgan for managing the chat, for Lynn for introducing us, Bill for the amazing presentation and, and exercises, and all of you for staying with us after a long day and participating in the session. We really appreciate the interest and would love to hear from you if you have interest, if you have interest in joining anything that we've mentioned, whether the training or the, the context-based sustainability community of practice. And of course, we have a few minutes left and are happy to, to answer questions, but I'll pass back to you for some final words, Bill. Sure. Just uh, it, it, most importantly, uh, to add you to the list of, of folks that we're thanking here, uh, Randy, thank you for um, working together to put together this, um, this uh, uh, workshop exercise uh, and presentation. Uh, and of course, thanks to the folks uh, with the, the RSD broadly that, that uh, helped to pull this entire uh, day-long symposium together. Uh, for uh, spotlighting the work of, of FEI, and, and thanks to you all for uh, attending. Um, uh, glad to stay on the line for any final questions, and as we mentioned, um, we did have some slides that we didn't get to, so we will be posting this uh, online. I know we can post it on the R3.0 website, and I'll announce that um, by, by social media, LinkedIn, so folks will be able to, to, to see these slides um, uh, uh, afterwards. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there unless folks have uh, uh, any final questions.
Thanks, Mark. Great. Well, maybe we'll we'll take it over to uh, to, to to social media and the rest of the RSD um, sessions for po folks to 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 share your thoughts about what you've learned here. So I look forward to uh, intersecting with you all um, out in the, the, the real world, so to speak. <laughs>